Hi, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I am going to be reading the first chapter of today is called The Songbird and the Rambutan Tree and this is by Lucille Abendanen. This book is historical fiction. It is about a girl named Emmy who lives in a place called Batavia in the Dutch East Indies and it takes place in 1942. That's the year that the book starts. Batavia has since become Jakarta in Indonesia. Emmy is Dutch and she lives there with her father. She has recently lost her mother to a snake bite and Emmy used to love to sing. She had a beautiful voice. She was going to go to this school in England so she could use that voice in a place that would support it and she hasn't sung since her mother died because singing was something that she did with her mother and she feels like she's lost her voice. Her best friend is a boy named Bhakti and he is Javanese. His mother works for Emmy and their father and there begins to be a little tension between the two of them and you see that the Javanese people are treated much differently than the Dutch people. This is right during World War II. The Japanese invade Batavia. They've invaded a lot of islands in the Dutch East Indies and other areas and they come to Java. All of the women and children get rounded up and taken to prisoner of war camps. And the camp that Emmy ends up at is called Tideng. And it was a real prisoner of war camp, and much of the book takes place in that camp. But in this first chapter, we get to see what life was like for Emmy before that. Chapter 1. February 1942, Batavia, Island of Java, Dutch East Indies. A peacock eating cake is not something you see every day, but at Violet's birthday parties, anything can happen. The vain creature struts across the perfectly manicured lawn toward its next victim, a little boy with an enormous slice of chocolate cake teetering on the edge of a floppy plate. The monkeys sense a feast too. They chatter and leap in the trees above the buffet table, making the leaves shake. They've got their eyes on the towering jello that's melting miserably in the heat, although the sweaty cupcakes wilting sandwiches, or dissolving crepes will do just as nicely. European party food in the tropics. How silly. Pound cake and fruit skewers would have lasted much better in this heat, but the monkeys aren't fussy. A servant patrols the table, slingshot in hand. Monkeys aren't afraid of people, but if you aim a slingshot at them, they skedaddle. I wish I could skedaddle. I'd rather eat a rotten mango buzzing with flies than suffer through this party. It's not like Violet invited me anyway. Papa said we have to come because Violet's pa, Mr. Brederode, invited us and he's a very important man in the government. You don't say no to the Brederodes. I can see Violet's pa across the garden now, swilling his glass of champagne and waffling on about the price of oil. He never talks about anything else. Well, except for the war, of course, and whether we'll be invaded. Now that Germany and Japan are on the same side, that's all anyone ever talks about. Maybe I can stay over here, hiding in the corner, and not have to speak to Violet or Mr. Brederode or anyone at all. I tug miserably at my collar. I feel like I'm melting, just like the ridiculous food. It's far too hot and humid for European-style party clothes. My dress is scratchy, my long socks make my legs prickle, and my feet feel as if they're about to explode out of my shoes. All I want to do is kick them off and sink my toes into the soft grass. On top of everything, it's monsoon season and could pour with rain at any moment. That hasn't put Violet off having her birthday party outside, of course. She's used to having things her way, and everyone had better do as they're told, even the weather. That silly peacock is terrorizing people again. A voice behind me says. I spin around and there's my best friend, Bhakti, grinning at me. What are you doing here? I whisper, glancing around. If Violet sees you, there'll be trouble. Bhakti's been my best friend since I was seven when his mom, Ibulia, came to work for us. He taught me how to spear a fish, how to dive down to where the rainbow corals grow, how to climb a coconut tree. He's a bit older than me, but if the wind's behind me, I can almost run as fast as him. Almost. He's never liked Violet, and I don't blame him because she's nothing but mean to us. Oh, please, she's as scary as a toothless piranha. He puffs out his chest and stands even taller. 
but I see him scan the garden. The peacock sidles closer to the little boy and his chocolate cake. It spreads its magnificent tail fan, its feathers shimmering emerald, sapphire, gold, and amethyst in the bright afternoon sun. Oh, watch out, little boy, I exclaim, but it's too late. The peacock lunges. The boy shrieks, throwing his plate up in the air. The cake arches gracefully, then lands on the grass with a splat, and the peacock gets its feast. See, what did I tell you? Violet has wafted over while our backs were turned. She's wearing her best blue dress and new white satin gloves. Now that she's 11, Violet thinks she's all grown up and can do silly things like wear elbow length gloves in this heat just because it's fashionable in Europe. Pfft, I say, pursing my lips. You haven't told us anything, Violet. You've only just come over. She narrows her blue eyes at me and her nose twitches like a snarl. Willem Shakespeare is simply the best looking peacock in the whole city of Batavia. Violet has a way of making everything she says sound like an absolute fact, even when she's talking nonsense. Pa brought him back from India, a gift from Lord and Lady Mountbatten. He's the viceroy and she's a countess, you know. I stare at her flatly. You know it's William Shakespeare, right? Without taking her eyes off me, she says, no servants in the garden unless you've got a tray in your hands. She doesn't look at Bhakti, but we both know she's talking to him. I feel a rush of irritation at her rudeness. You should be careful your face doesn't turn as ugly as your words. Violet smirks, and when I look at Bhakti, I see why. He's staring at the ground as if willing it to open up and swallow him whole. I could kill her. Bhakti used to swat Violet's rude comments away like they were annoying mosquitoes, but not anymore. Since he turned 13, it became extra sensitive to everything. Now her words sting. This letter came for you, Bhakti mumbles, rubbing the top of his ear. He holds an envelope out to me. Ibu said it's important and that you'd want to open it straight away. He speaks Dutch, overpronouncing every word, and I know it's because Violet is listening. He's always so worried about his accent, even though he speaks Dutch perfectly well. Something inside me twinges like a pulled muscle. If she wasn't here, we'd speak Malayu, his own language. But Violet can't understand Malayu, or doesn't want to. I stare at the envelope in his hand. My mouth is suddenly bone dry. Violet's party fades into the background, and all I can hear is a whooshing sound pulsing in my ears. Well, aren't you going to open this very important letter? Violet's trying to sound like she doesn't really care, but I know she's dying to know what's in it. I don't need to open it. I already know what it is. Just give her a minute, Bhakti says. Don't you have some snakes to look for or something? Violet snaps in his direction. I take the letter from him with trembling hands and shove it behind my back. I'm sure it's nothing, I say, my voice shaking. I'll open it at home. Violet's eyes grow wide. Wait, is that the letter from the fancy singing school? Her voice rises excitedly. After all this time? Before I can stop her, she lunges behind me and grabs the envelope. She flips it in her hands as if tossing a pen and cock in a frying pan. Oh, feels heavy. Must be good news. She scans the garden and smiles at me wickedly. Next thing I know, she's dragging me across the lawn toward the grand piano, standing on a raised platform in the middle of the garden. Everybody, she calls. May I have your attention, please? Violet, no! I hiss, trying to wrench free. People are already staring at us, curious about what the birthday girl has to say. Someone even taps their cake fork against their champagne glass. I look pleadingly back at Bhakti, but he can't do a thing to help. If he tries, he'll be the one in trouble. We reach the piano and a hush descends. Ladies and gentlemen, our dear Emmeline has just had a letter with some wonderful news. My stomach plummets. What is she doing? And in celebration, she would like to perform a song for us. The glee in her voice is sickening. The crowd murmurs their approval. Violet clicks her gloved fingers at the sweaty pianist. Play! Play what, Miss Violet? He says, looking every bit as terrified as I feel. Doesn't matter, Violet says through gritted teeth. She can sing anything. I feel like I'm going to pass out. Violet, please, I whisper, panic catching in my throat. You know I can't do this. Of course you can, Violet says. You sang last year with your mother, didn't you? The pianist is already rushing through the introduction to a song, and Violet strides away smugly. 
When I don't start singing, there's an awkward silence. The pianist plays the introduction again, slower this time. He does an exaggerated nod when I'm supposed to come in. I scan the crowd desperately for Papa, but I can't see him anywhere. What I can see is a sea of faces staring at me. I know some of them. They were here last year too when I sang with Mama. Now Pity knits their brows and settles heavy on their downturned mouths. Poor Emmy, why won't she sing? A group of boys and girls from my class snigger to each other behind their hands. Their sideways glances cut like knives. I spot Bhakti standing at the back, fists balled up, a grim look on his face. It's hard to breathe. Darkness creeps in from the corners of my eyes and I back away from the piano. Just as I'm about to run, there's a commotion up at the house. Someone shrieks and everyone turns to look, including me. Mrs. Brederode, Violet's ma, comes hurtling along the terrace, clutching her sun hat to her head. She almost trips down the wide stone steps, but manages to steady herself on one of the two giant marble lines stretched out at the bottom. She comes running toward us, red in the face and waggling her hand in front of her as if she's hailing a bet jack taxi. We're doomed, she wails, collapsing dramatically on the ground. The rest of her message is heard only by those gathered around fanning her. Bhakti sprints over to me. You okay? I shrug miserably, my cheeks still burning. Okay is the very last thing I feel. What's happened? He shakes his head. No idea. I couldn't hear. We watch as Mrs. B's news ripples around the garden. It must be serious because the men hurry inside and the women whisper in shock. Emmy! Papa rushes down from the house and across the garden toward us. There you are. Come on, we're going home. He nods at Bhakti, his face creased with worry. All around us, people are leaving, their plates and glasses strewn across the lawn. The monkeys are ransacking the food table, squabbling over fistfuls of jello and unraveled crepes. But all I can think about is that my humiliation is finally over. Emmy, did you hear me? Papa shakes me gently so that I focus on him. The Japanese have invaded Singapore. Everyone's saying they're coming for us next. That is the end of chapter one. Already in that chapter, you can see the difference between this European Dutch lifestyle and how they treat someone like Bhakti, who is native to the island and who is a servant. Emmy feels angry with Violet, but she doesn't really see where any inequality exists between herself and Bhakti. And this is something that she starts to think about and learn about as the book goes on. I think that's a really valuable part of this story, this exploring of uh, colonialism and class. As I said before, most of this book takes place at this prisoner of war camp. There are a lot of parts of it that are pretty grim. These women didn't have much, but they did make do with what they had. And they also found moments of joy in the years that they were there. They also found each other in interesting ways. And one of the things I loved about this book was this aspect of this found family, the people that most unexpectedly came together in this prisoner of war camp and the people that became really important to Emmy and really became her family. This book was based on the life of the author's grandmother who was at a prisoner of war camp, although she went later, she went when she was an adult. And the author's grandfather was also sent away. He was sent to a different camp where he was tasked with many Dutch men during this time on building a railroad. I learned so much about the history of this area while I read this book. I didn't really know much about it at all before I started. And I found myself constantly putting the book down and going to look something up because I wanted to learn more. The author has an excellent afterword where she explains what her grandmother went through and the inspiration for this book and where she explains the history of this area at this time. Emmy is a wonderful part of this book. She has spirit and strength and she's a really great narrator to get the story from. I recommend that you read The Songbird and the Ramutan Tree by Lucille Abendanen. I really enjoyed this book and learned a lot while I read it. Thank you for joining me.